most of cancer research today, in contrast to what to what we're what we've defined, is focused on on the gene mutations associated with with the disease. So um, the the concept of personalized medicine in cancer involves the uh, development of drugs that will target specific uh, mutations that are found in various tumors with the hope of, of, of um, correcting the disease. The, pro the problem with that strategy is, is that there are literally thousands, and some people have even estimated millions of mutations in, in tumor cells, uh, which makes uh, uh, the targeting of any one or, or a group of, of mutations a, a pretty daunting task. And um, most of these so-called targeted therapies uh, come with a significant amount of adverse toxic effects, uh, which I've always found strange that if a personalized medicine is supposed to target and kill cancer cells um, specifically, why, why do the patients become so violently ill as the result of this uh, so-called uh, personalized medicine? It, it appears to me that many of these drugs have a very significant off-target effect uh, on the body as well. Our approach to this disease is basically a non-toxic metabolic approach that targets the uh, metabolic deficiency of the, of the tumor while enhancing the health and vitality of normal cells, a very striking contrast. It's a disease of mitochondrial function, which is the key metabolic component within the cell. And when mitochondria become dysfunctional, one of the possible consequences is the origin of, of cancer. Otto Warburg found many years ago that the um, uh, cancer cells are primarily uh, fermenters of, of glucose. They take glucose in, they, they um, um, metabolize it up to the point of a molecule called pyruvate, which is then fermented. And um, it seems as though almost all cancer cells uh, will, will have this property. And, and the reason for this is, is because their mitochondria have suffered some sort of um, insufficiency or damage. And as the result, the tumor cells then must uh, uh, ferment, which is a very primitive form of energy in order for them to survive. So most tumor cells will either ferment glucose or possibly amino acids like glutamine uh, for, for their survival. So this then allows these cells to, to grow and, and persist. You can prevent cancer simply by keeping your mitochondria healthy. Uh, and what I mean by that is that with age, your mitochondria uh, get, get uh, inefficient, and this is a natural aging process, that's why cancer is more common in older people than younger people. Um, therapeutic fasting is a great way to enhance the, the functionality of the mitochondria to prevent cancer. You will not get cancer if mitochondria are healthy. It's just mitochondria are damaged by a variety of different things in the environment, chemicals, radiation, uh, inflammation, viruses, even inherited gene mutations that damage certain kinds of these mutations will damage the functionality of the mitochondria, thereby leading to inherited forms of cancer. But by and large, we can prevent cancer if we can keep the mitochondria healthy. We have a very active research program in epilepsy, and uh, we have developed some of the best animal models uh, uh, for epileptic seizures that I, I did with collaborators in Japan. Um, we, we highlighted this one particular uh, model which is a, a replica of, uh, of a human form of seizure. And it's known for, for decades that the ketogenic diet is very effective against seizures, seizure disorders in children. And uh, we tested this on our animal model of epilepsy, and we found it to also be very, very therapeutic and effective in blocking these seizures. Um, the mechanism by which the diet works against epilepsy is far less clear than understanding the mechanism by which the diet works to, to target and, and um, kill tumor cells, uh, interestingly enough. But we found that the, 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 the way these diets work is through a calorie restriction. The diets do not work if individuals or mice eat large amounts of these high-fat diets. So it was clearly linked to a calorie restriction. So we, uh, we found that if we calorie restricted by a little bit these ketogenic diets, the therapeutic benefits of low glucose and elevated ketones become much greater than if one were simply to restrict, voluntarily restrict uh, calories from any kind of a diet. So our understanding of how the diet was implemented for epilepsy allowed us to fine tune this and, and transition it for, uh, for cancer. And as the result, um, we think that the diet and this metabolic approach in to be specific 
the, meta, the ketogenic diet matched with certain low-dose non-toxic drugs could potentially be far more therapeutic for the cancer population than it is for the patients with epilepsy. If we view cancer as a genetic disease, um, and as I've written in my book, it's not a genetic disease, basically. The gene mutations are downstream epiphenomena of damaged respiration. So, so the, the mutations are red herrings, basically. And the reason why we're not making any major progress is because we're focusing on something that's not the prime problem of the disease. And it's been very clear. Um, and most of the, interestingly enough, those few drugs that have been, had uh, ra rather good success in the clinic, such as Gleevec and Herceptin and these ones that people have used for various blood and breast cancers, um, actually target the same metabolic pathway that, that does the ketogenic diet. It, the, the difference is the ketogenic diet will target those pathways in all cancers, whereas the so-called personalized drugs target those pathways only in those very few individuals that might have that mutation. So why anyone would want to use those toxic drugs when there's another alternative to do the same thing without toxic problems is, is a very difficult uh, thing to comprehend. The ketogenic diet, um, uh, which was originally developed for treatment of epilepsy in children, um, is a zero carbohydrate or very, very low carbohydrate, high fat diet. And, and what happens when, when people eat the ketogenic diet in uh, relatively restricted amounts, uh, blood glucose levels go down and uh, ketones go up. And ketones are breakdown products of fats and they've evolved to provide our brain with energy uh, when glucose is no longer available or when people uh, don't have access, ready access to food. Our bodies can make energy from within. We mobilize fats, the fats are then metabolized to these ketones, which then the brain can use as, a, as an alternative to glucose. So for the tumors now, uh, the tumors which are dependent on glucose also, primarily for their growth, um, will have difficulty in now trying to compete with normal cells for the availability of a restricted food uh, source, which is glucose. On the other hand, the tumor cells can't utilize the ketones for energy as can the normal cells. So this diet, this metabolic therapy, pretty much restricts the primary fuels for the tumor while the body can transition uh, to the ketones and, and can actually get healthier with this. A very, a very nice way to, um, to marginalize the tumor growth. The ketogenic diet is um, it, it's mostly um, uh, certain parts, the way we define them is a one to one, two to one, or three to one. This means uh, two parts fat to one part protein plus carbohydrate. And the more ketogenic the diet is, the greater the amount of fat. So the, the, most, uh, the, the most fat laden diets would be a four to one, four parts fat to one part protein plus carb. Now what these diets will consist of is a variety of, of butters and creams and coconut oils and, and these kinds of things, um, which are metabolized to ketone bodies while keeping the carbohydrate content of the diet uh, very low. The proteins are uh, um, a little bit less than normal, but they're not, they're not terribly restricted. It's the carbohydrates that are, are primarily restricted. So the content, the, the amount that people eat is very important because, um, the, because if, if you eat a lot of this diet, it's not healthy because of all the fat. But if you eat a restricted amount of the diet, it can be very, very healthy. Um, as, the, as the body begins to transition off. And what we do with various individuals who try it, we move them from a, from a one to one type of diet all the way up to a three to one or possibly a four to one. And that makes the transition much, more, much, more, much easier for the, for the individual that would like to battle their cancer uh, using this metabolic approach. But the key is a high fat diet with low carbohydrates and uh, a transition or a fine tuning of the diet to match every individual's uh, type of metabolism so it, can be pal uh, so it can be accommodated a little bit easier in their life. The diet is very well accepted for children. Um, there's a group at Johns Hop Hopkins would like to see it as the first line rather than a second line of approach for cancer management. In other words, if the child doesn't respond to the ketogenic diet, then, then you would consider a pharmaceutical approach. The, 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 the situation today is that when a child doesn't respond to pharmacy after a number of attempts at cocktails and this sort, then they'll be uh, uh, recommended the ketogenic diet, which in many cases is, is very therapeutic. Um, 
and you don't have the toxic effects of the drugs associated with that. So uh, we, we think this could also be uh, a, a easily adapted to, to cancer management, uh, again, with the same high, high uh, therapeutic benefits with minimal, if any, toxicity. So it, it's, a, it's a very good uh, fit. This is not a money generating kind of an approach. So clinical trials, uh, who, who will step forward to conduct the type of clinical trial that will, that will provide evidence uh, for the use of this approach? So, so it's not gaining as, as widespread use, mainly because many of the physicians or oncologists never heard of it. Uh, they're unfamiliar with the basic concepts of this. They're not trained to use this. Um, there's little money to be made in this approach. So you put all these together and it's, it's clear uh, why this approach has not, has not been recognized as a, as a very effective alternative to the current um, uh, radiation and toxic chemotherapies that are presently being used. If you want to learn how to implement the ketogenic diet and the press pulse protocol into your cancer management, just visit school.com slash keto for cancer, the new community by our research analyst, Johnny Rockermeyer. Within this new community platform, you can connect with other patients and learn from their experiences. You can also just search through the posts other members have already made. You will have access to our classroom section as well, which provides practical advice and tools for the best results. These sections cover all parts of the Press Pulse protocol that you should implement. Starting with the general scientific concepts by Dr. Thomas Seifred, we will show you how to start the ketogenic diet, including which foods to choose and which to avoid. Additionally, we prepared a list of doctors specialized in metabolic therapy, as well as details about glutamine inhibition and hyperbaric oxygen protocols. So, take a look around at school.com slash keto for cancer. I mean, right now there's a trial initiating at the University of Iowa for lung cancer. Uh, there's a trial that just completed in Germany uh, looking at... Um, uh, you know, tolerability of the diet, and they found it to be mostly tolerable. It had no toxic effects on the patients. This is a European trial. Um, there's a new trial uh, that's starting at the VA at Pittsburgh, Pittsburgh VA, uh, which is just getting underway. There's another trial from a private practice group out of Bethesda, Maryland, which, got, which just recently has approval and they're recruiting patients at this time. Um, the two studies that have been published in humans, one by Linda Nebling, in 1995 and the other one by, by us uh, in, in collaboration with an, a, a group of Italian uh, physicians. Uh, both clearly show efficacy in children and adults. Um, so uh, there's a great need for more uh, of these kinds of trials and, and, um, and analyses in the human population. And there's a real possibility that the humans will respond much better to this therapy than do, than do the uh, animal models. The, the art that we used in that book um, uh, came primar primarily from the work of Robert Pope, who uh, um, battled um, uh, Hodgkin's disease uh, back in the 1990s and subsequently passed away from that disease. But during his um, experience in, in, in battling the disease, he was able to uh, incorporate in his artwork the various um, personal aspects of, 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 of his, uh, his experience and that of others who, who he shared uh, experiences with in, in the cancer clinic. Uh, I've used a number of his, of, his art, of his artwork. I was given permission by the Robert Pope Foundation to do this, and they were quite, they were quite happy that I, that, I, that I did this. I also used other images from other individuals who have had family members die from cancer and uh, how, the, how this disease uh, impacts uh, the, personal, uh, the personal experience. So I, I, think, I think when you consider the images of cancer, you have to look at it from all perspectives, not only from a, a, a metabolic disease or a genetic disease or a, a purely um, abstract uh, series of, of genetic mutations, but actually what, what the disease represents a, a, as, a human, a, as a human suffering. Possible plans for a follow-up layman's version is certainly on, on the table. Um, and and I, may, I may need to do this at some point but, but you're right about the fact that there are a lot of lay people, significant numbers, who have been able to read and understand uh, a significant amount of what was actually I I in the book. 
which is pleasing to me in the sense that it's, it goes beyond just the scientific community. But you're right. The, it, you're, you're not going to move the field forward unless those in the trenches that are actually doing the work are convinced that this is the right way to go. Those in the pharmaceutical industry, those in the academic community. Um, you can have a groundswell of interest apart, uh, on the part of the lay public, but without having the scientific evidence to support what's, what, what, what the main thrust is, it's going to be hard to change the field. So the, the most important aspect uh, of, this, of this book is to target those key aspects that people are currently investigating with respect to the, to the underlying mechanisms of cancer. And once that can be shifted, then uh, uh, another book uh, which will actually be focused more on the lay public uh, would certainly be in the works. I'd just like to mention that the book was dedicated to the millions of people who have suffered and died from the toxic effects of, of chemotherapies and continue to do so. And I, and I think this, our approach is um, one solution to this problem. Uh, once the underlying mechanisms uh, are recognized and, uh, and, and, and uh, exploited, uh, I think there's a real chance that um, we can make cancer a very manageable disease with minimal uh, 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 adverse effects to the, to the individuals that have this disease. The, the Boston Co College Library was very helpful uh, uh, in providing access uh, of this book to a, a, a number of students, both uh, in form of the hardcover uh, as well as the ebook. And the library has done a, 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 a very excellent job in, in making this book uh, available to Boston College community and outside the community as well.